I'm Bob Infantino, Associate Dean in Computer Math and Natural Sciences, and we're very pleased that all of you took part in our 16th annual Bioscience Day. It's hard to believe that there have been 16. I've been at every one of them, but there are 16. Um, uh, I would also like to bring greetings from our Dean, Jayant Banavar. Some people have already noticed he's absent today. He had a spill earlier in the week, and he is under doctor's orders to be recovering. He is a very impatient patient. He has texted me and emailed me about 25 times to try and find out how things are going. So uh, he was kept under house arrest by his physician today, but he should be back to us soon. Um, we are also delighted to have many university partners in this uh, endeavor. Colleges all across our campus help to support this. I know that uh, Dean Ball is here from Behavioral and Social Sciences, and Dean Clark is back there from the School of Public Health. And they, along with many other units, are our partners in bringing you Biosciences Day every year. Um, we could not do this without our great organizer, Gene Farrick, who is uh, the assistant to the dean. And he already told me we need to talk tomorrow about next year's Biosciences Day. So uh, Biosciences Day and Maryland Day are all-consuming passions for Gene, who just walked in the back. And we would really like to recognize his efforts in making this successful. Our keynote lecture today is the eighth anniversary of our first Dr. Eric B. and Joyce Young keynote lecture to be held on Biosciences Day. Eric is a 1974 biochemistry alumnus in our college who went on to the University of Maryland Medical School and then on to a successful career as a physician, an OBGYN, and also a real estate developer. He and his wife, Joyce, who enjoyed a long career in nursing and now wellness, um, uh, maintain a real active interest in the life sciences, research and education, and they have generously supported this talk for the past eight years. And we were recounting the luminaries who have been a part of this. Uh, E.O. Wilson was our first, Dan Jansen, we were, we were talking about them before we started. So their support has been uh, wonderful in, in helping to provide our keynote lecture. The Youngs are lovers of learning and true partners in giving back to our campus. Uh, Eric was a member of the University of Maryland Foundation Board of Trustees, and they have supported uh, this lecture, uh, Eric's home department of chemistry and biochemistry, and several other programs on our campus for many years, including a travel study award to help support study abroad for our undergraduates, and I know at least 30 students, including many students in CMNS, have been supported in their international education through that fund. We're delighted that Eric and Joyce are here today, and we thank them for their loyal support, and Eric will talk a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I graduated from Maryland in biochemistry back in the 70s, which is ancient history in science these days, as fast as things are moving. And Joyce and I, through the years, have had the opportunity to support the university in many ways, but usually it's been for student scholarships, almost exclusively for student scholarships. And about eight, nine years ago, uh, after I, we made an unrestricted gift to the chemistry department, um, Ms. Morris came up with the idea of let's take this lecture series that had been given for eight years as part of Bioscience Day and make it a named lecture series. And uh, we were very proud of the fact that she asked us if we could become sponsors of this. And as you mentioned, the, the lecture series has evolved uh, over the years from strictly being mostly in the biological sciences. When E.O. Wilson talked about running around Brazil chasing butterflies with a net, to um, Gene Robertson talking about colony collapse disorder in bees and the application of modern science to that. And now that we've had the merger of biological sciences and what I call the hard sciences in CMNS, we're seeing lectures that are really speaking about how the application of computers and mathematics and analytical systems are having a profound effect on, on biological studies and medicine, et cetera. So uh, after that merger, we've heard from experts such as Dr. Collins, who was the director of the NIH. He was speaking about the advancement of genetic, genetic diagnoses. And today we're going to hear from Dr. Hood, who's going to talk about systems biology. And all of you know more about that than I do, and its application to the P4 approach uh, in medicine, which is an initiative that's 
now being recognized in medicine and should have profound effects on how medicine is delivered in the next couple of decades. Uh, Joyce and I are very proud to be able to honor to do this series. And the reason is because uh, we're told it has sort of become the keynote event at the end of Bioscience Days, something that in Maryland has been uh, very active and it's well regarded on campus. We're also proud of the fact that it, it brings together multidisciplinary contributors to the success of this day. And it has also fostered collaborations between the university and specifically CMNS and national institutions such as the NIH and, and NIST. And you'll probably hear from Dr. May, who is uh, one of the top gentlemen at NIST about uh, this collaboration. And frankly, I think it was through Dr. May's efforts that uh, Dr. Hood was asked to join us, and uh, he has. So uh, please enjoy the lecture. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for those that come year after year after year. Uh, and uh, Bob, thank you. Thanks very much to both you, uh, Eric and Joyce. Uh, we are also very pleased uh, that our excellent partner, the National Institutes of Standard and Technology, has been with us today in some of the, the presentations this afternoon. And uh, we have a real partnership of excellence with NIST, fostering real world-class research in areas like quantum science and information, and we continue to explore new opportunities in areas such as the quantitative life sciences. To introduce our keynote speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Willie May, who is the Under Secretary of Commerce and the leader of the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Willie was appointed to this position this spring by President Obama, and after enduring confirmation from the Senate, uh, was uh, seated as director. Uh, this is a capstone of sorts for Willie's career in more than, <clears throat> it was on the internet, 40 years of service at NIST, where he began as a bench chemist in the National Bureau of Standards. Uh, we are very delighted that Willie is also a proud alumnus of our college. He earned his PhD in chemistry here in the 70s. He is a former computer math and natural sciences alumnus of the year. And uh, you won't tire from hearing from him today, but if you're not tired, you should come to our dis December commencement because he will be our commencement speaker. So without further ado, Willie will introduce our speaker. Good afternoon, everyone. You're really in for a treat, and it won't be coming from me. Uh, it is truly an honor and a pleasure for me, me to introduce my friend, Dr. Leroy Hood, director of the Institute of Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington. His outstanding contributions have had a resounding effect on the advancement of science since the 1960s. He has been one of the most prominent figures on the biotechnology scene for at least the last three decades. He has introduced concepts and developed technologies that have revolutionized the way we think about biotechnology and more importantly, the way that we think about medicine. Lee started his work at Caltech, he'll tell you when, uh, where he and his colleagues pioneered techniques that have completely opened up the field of genomics and played a critical role in contributing to the successful mapping of the human genome during the 1990s. In fact, he made that possible, that was largely made possible by the automatic DNA, DNA sequencer that he helped to invent. In 1992, he moved on to the University of Washington in Seattle as founder and chairman of the nation's first cross-disciplinary department in biology, the Department of Molecular Biotechnology. In 2000, he co-founded the Institute of Systems Biology there in Seattle to pioneer systems approaches to biology and medicine. His awards are far too many for me to mention in total, but it's only appropriate that I mention a few. The Lasker Prize he received the Alaska Prize in 1987 for studies of immune diversity. In 2002, he received the Kyoto Award, uh, a Kyoto Prize, that is, for developing advanced technologies. 
in several areas. In 2003, uh, the Lemonson uh, MIT Prize for Innovation and Invention and the Association of Molecular Pathology Award for Excellence in Molecular Diagnostics. In 2004, he received the Biotechnology Heri Heritage Award for Lifetime Achievements in Biotechnology. His lifetime contributions to biotechnology also earned him the 2006 Heinz Award in Technology for his extraordinary breakthroughs in biomedical science at the genetic level. We're not done. In 2007, he was elected to the Inventors Hall of Fame for his earlier development of that automatic, uh, automated DNA sequencer. In 2011, he received the National Academy of Engineering's uh, Russ Prize for developing the automated DNA sequencer again that, again, revolutionized genomics and medicine. In 2013, he received the National Medal of Science, belatedly from President Obama. He should have got it much earlier. And earlier this year, Dr. Hood was chosen as one of the world's 50 most influential scientists. Throughout his career, he's published more than 750 peer-reviewed papers. Back before they kicked me out of the laboratory, I fantasized about maybe having 150 and, or 200. He received, he's had 750. Uh, 36 patents in biochemistry, immunology, molecular biology, uh, genetics, and systems biology. Lee is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the American Association of Arts and Sciences, and the Institute, the Institute of Medicine, and the National Academy of Engineering. Dr. Hood has also played a role in founding more than 15 biotechnology companies. A few of those are household names, like Amgen, Applied Biosystem, Systemix, Darwin Rosetta, and the newly formed diagnostic company called Integrated Diagnostics. He's received more than 17 honorary degrees from national uh, and international universities. He is currently pioneering systems medicines and systems approaches to uh, disease with the ultimate objective of transforming healthcare to a discipline that is predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory is P4 medicine. It was Dr. Hood's work that inspired President Obama to launch the recent national initiative on precision medicine. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Leroy Hood. Well, thank you very much, uh, Willie. What uh, uh, a kind and gracious uh, introduction. So uh, I'd like to make three opening statements. One is this is the most fun time in science in my entire career of 50 years. And I look out with envy at the young students who have so many options before them. and. Uh, I, th I think it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful ride. We do have a few issues that we have to settle with regard to funding and things, but the opportunities are give you the chance to do almost anything only limited by your imagination. So the second point is I would say that in the last 15 years or so, there's been an enormous revolution in medicine, which I've come to call systems medicine. And I'll define that in detail for you. But what is really interesting is it places us at an incredible tipping point where we're in a position to transform healthcare in a short, I hope, rather than a very long period of time. And that transformation 
at, at the very end of the lecture, I'll, I'll show you has already begun to happen. And the final point I would make, and maybe this is the most important point from uh, your personal points of view, is your health is really about two things. It's about wellness, and it's about our ability to manage disease. And I'm going to make the point that from here on out, wellness is going to be far and away the most important aspect in healthcare for you and in figuring out how to deal with disease. So let's see if I can get through all of those things. As you heard from Willie, uh, I went to uh, Caltech in 1970, and I remember as I thought about what I should do in my new lab, um, being really overwhelmed with the uh, complexity of both biology and disease. I was a molecular immunologist then, and immunology then as today is, was a prime example of complexity, but then as today, it's a prime example of opportunity. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. You know, this complexity was very much like this old analogy of the elephant felt by six blind men, each feeling a different part, and declaring that the elephant is a spear or a stump or a fan. And, and really, the elephant as a complex biological system is all of those and much more. And what was really clear at that time, although I'm not sure in uh, the early 70s I would have articulated it as I am today, is we really needed three things to be able to deal with complex biological systems. One, we needed a way to think about complexity and systems biology has, I think in spades, given us that opportunity in the last uh, 15 years or so. Number two, we needed to develop all sorts of systems-driven new technologies. We needed to be able to make measurements that didn't exist in the early 70s. What molecular biology could do was just the barest indentation uh, into complexity. And number three, we needed to develop systems-driven strategies, new approaches to doing science that could deal uh, again with complexity and again with, uh, with big problems. And in fact, it was in about 1970 or three or so, I remember reading this book as a young assistant professor uh, on Thomas Kuhn's book on the structure of scientific revolutions, where he talked about paradigm changes in physics. And, and the, the points he made that were really interesting is one, Paradigm changes are really hard to affect for two reasons. One, they require that you really think out of the box. You bring new approaches to old ideas, and that requires uh, originality and, and, uh, and an ability not to get bogged down in the present and the past. But he said, second, paradigm changes are really hard to realize because most scientists are incredibly conservative and they're very reluctant to give up long-held ideas. And how you make them change uh, is uh, absolutely a fascinating question. Well, I had the good luck, again, as you heard from Willie, to be involved in a series of paradigm changes over the 45 or so years of my career. And these paradigm changes really, on the one hand, focused on dealing with complexity, but on the other hand, they irrevocably pointed towards systems medicine and P4 medicine, uh, which is what most of this lecture be about. So the first was bringing engineering to, uh, to biology, and we developed actually uh, four instruments at Caltech and two instruments later that basically allowed one to read and write DNA in various ways. And this opened up, one, high-throughput biology, and two, uh, that eventually led to big data and its analytics. I'll say, ironically, I remember my chair coming into me after I'd been at Caltech just three months, and uh, three years, I'm sorry, and said, um, I'm here to advise you in the strongest possible terms to give up all this engineering stuff. 
And I said, no, it was going well. I was going to do it anyway. And I asked him 25 years later why he said that. And he said he said it because the senior biologists at Caltech felt it was unseemly to have engineering in a biology department. And they wanted me moved to engineering. He said, at least I didn't uh, ask you to do that. And, and you'll see this attitude a little later. And in the end, it was the reason I ended up leaving Caltech, which is an incredible institution and was a wonderful place to start my career, no question. And as you heard, the second paradigm change came about as a consequence of uh, developing the automated DNA sequencer and uh, in the mid 80s, that getting me invited to the first ever meeting in the spring of uh, 1985 at Santa Cruz to consider the Human Genome Project and its merits. 12 uh, relevant scientists got invited and debated this topic, and, and, and we really came to two very interesting conclusions. One was it was feasible, though difficult in 1985 to imagine getting this done, but the second was even more interesting. It was the sociology because we were split six to six on whether it was a good idea, and those people against it were fanatically against it. And when I went out into the community to talk about it in 85 and 6 and 7, I would say 90% of the scientists were opposed to the Human Genome Project. And the institution that was most bitterly opposed was the National Institutes of Health. And it was relentless up until the very end when a National Academy committee uh, uh, investigating the Human Genome Project said it will be, then it flipped around and did a, uh, a nice job, obviously, in pushing it forward. But again, from the point of view of systems biology, what the Genome Project did with us, for us for the first time, was it gave us a complete parts list of all the genes and by inference all the proteins. So for the first time, we could start thinking in systems terms about human biology and how we could approach it in a much more global and comprehensive sense. The other, uh, the other feature that became obvious from developing the uh, automated DNA sequencer was that I had to bring together really good chemistry, uh, computer science, engineering, and molecular biology to really put the idea of four-color chemistry and capillaries and all the things that you're all familiar with. And that led to the idea that I thought all new biology departments in the future should be cross-disciplinary in nature. So you could do leading-edge biology, but you'd have an environment where you could then drive the leading-edge relevant technologies and develop the analytic tools for analyzing the, uh, the information. And I proposed that to Caltech, and everybody in the community thought it was a great idea, except the biologists, and they vetoed it. So Bill Gates made it possible to go to Seattle and set up the first institute there, and it was unbelievably successful. Two of our faculty members invented the first two critical techniques in the then newly emerging field of proteomics. Uh, Phil Green developed the software that drove the Human Genome Project, both assembly and quality control. Gare Vandening invented multi-parameter cell sorter. I developed the inkjet technology that Agilent has since commercialized for large-scale DNA synthesis, and on and on and on. But what was really interesting is the serendipity makes such a uh, it has such a big impact on people's lives, and you have to be prepared to deal with it. The dean that recruited me had promised after four years another floor that I could build systems biology on top of the cross-disciplinary biology department, and he died in an avalanche in the Himalayas at the end of year four, and the new dean came in with a totally different set of priorities. So after three years of struggle, I resigned, and. Uh, set up the, the, uh, the Institute for uh, 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 Systems Biology. And of course, that pioneered systems thinking, systems approaches to 
biology and disease, and that ultimately led to systems medicine and P4 medicine, as we discussed. Now, as a general lecture, let me make four comments about these paradigm changes, and I think the most important of these comments is the very last one. So I would say, as you can see, that each of these paradigm changes did have a big impact on biology and really made a difference. Each of them really generated enormous skepticism. I can remember when I started the Institute for Systems Biology, David Baltimore, who's, who was a good friend, we share a house in Montana together, writing me a letter saying, I've always been incredibly successful doing biology, one gene and one protein at a time, and I see no reason that has to change. And then he went on to say, the systems biology is pure hype and is worthless. Yeah. So it's great to have friends who tell you what they really think, right? But uh, anyway, he's totally changed his mind since that time. At least they can, uh, they can do that. In organizations, if you want people to do something for you, you've got to go to the top and persuade the top guy about the vision, about whatever you'd like to do. And I've had all sorts of experiences with failures there. But I think the most important uh, idea is Rarely can a really new idea emerge from an old organization because the bureaucracy of an organization is honed by the past and generally has trouble with the present, let alone the future. And to get new things to be achieved, you had to have completely new uh, organizations. And I'll say in the first four of those paradigm changes, completely new organizations emerged and drove these things, and it'll be interesting to see just what happens with medicine. Well, let's talk a little bit about what I see a systems view of medicine is. So medical, so disease is incredibly complex. Medicine, obviously, is incredibly complex. So the first concept that is central to uh, systems medicine is the idea that we have to be able to generate enormous virtual clouds of billions of data points that are dynamical, that keep uh, adding information about your environment as time passes. And the idea is that we can integrate these data to identify actionable possibilities that will either let us optimize your wellness and or avoid disease. And I'll show you that this is unequivocally true in a experiment that we did uh, in 2014. I would say the second really important point is we can extract the data from these dense and dynamic data clouds to give us networks that operate at all the different scales across biological life, at the chromosomal, at the molecular, at the level of uh, 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 organs, at the level of organisms. And they operate in an integrated mode to actually regulate development and physiology and aging. And if disease perturbed, they cause disease. So if you can identify the nature of the difference between a normal and a relevant disease perturbed network, you get fundamental insights into disease mechanisms, and it opens up new possibilities for diagnostics and therapeutics and I'll show you some examples of these. And I'd say the third thing that is absolutely fundamental to systems medicine is how we think about the data. One, the data should be as global or comprehensive as possible. We can do that with genomic. It's harder with almost all of the other omic types of data, although that's really being changed now. Two, it's really critical that we look at the dynamics of systems because the dynamics, whether they're temporal dynamics or spatial dynamics, are absolutely key to dealing with the problem that plagues big data, and that is signal-to-noise issues. The integration of the different types of data together, we've already talked about. And let me just say, I think 
where most people fail in biology is they don't begin to realize its complexity and the signal to noise problems it represents. And by far the biggest signal to noise problems come from biologies that are irrelevant to the biology you need to be interested in. So how do we subtract away all of this biological noise? You cannot do it by machine learning. You have to do it by the integration of domain expertise in biology with the very, very powerful tools of uh, computation and technology. So by 2006, we had evolved uh, clearly uh, a vision of what systems medicine is. And we were beginning to have an idea of what uh, P4 medicine was all about. Those, those terms got uh, cast uh, in, uh, in the early uh, 2000s. But the, the real challenge was for both of those, we were really in this pos same position as we were with the elephant. We were mostly blind men doing a few different things and we were making proud inferences about what this was all about. And we really didn't have, well, even uh, we had a framework for thinking about complexity, but we needed new technologies and new uh, strategies. And uh, what happened in 2007 was one of the most fortunate experiences in my life because inadvertently I met the Minister of Finance for the state of Luxembourg, who just at that time had decided he was going to diversify Luxembourg's economy away from a 90% dependence on financial services and bring in biotech and healthcare. So he said, would you be interested in helping us do this? Write a proposal. So we did write a proposal, and we did a bunch of things for them which were very, very successful that I won't talk about. But what they did for us is they gave us $100 million over five years to invent the tools and the strategies of P4 medicine. What this enabled us to do is to take on high-risk, high-gain projects, and once we prove them, to carry them all the way through to final verification. Most of these projects would, and many of them had already been rejected by NIH and NSF and other funding agencies, but they would never have given the resources that made kind of the global generation of these technologies possible, and I'll, I'll show you what some of these are like. So anyway, at the end of that time, in 2012, 13, we were really at this incredible tipping point, and then I proposed that one way to take P4 medicine, which we'll find in a few moments, and really move it into the clinic was to propose taking on 100,000 well individuals and carrying out a longitudinal study where for each we created these dense and dynamic data clouds that we could use to optimize wellness and avoid disease. And of course, uh, that was a big global picture, but what we did in 2014, which we'll talk about in a few moments, is we recruited 107 of my friends to go through and do this and provide a proof of principle for what this is all about. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, what was really interesting then is once we had these, uh, and I'll, I'll make one more point too, the 100 Pioneer Initiative, the 2014 initiative, I did go to NIH and I talked with the director and two heads of institutes and from every place they said, this isn't on our priority list, we don't have enough money, we have priorities for other things, there's no way we could ever fund something like this. And of course, I wonder, whether they had at that time really heard about precision medicine. I can really only conclude they haven't because I think as you'll see, what I'm talking about here is the essence of what precision medicine really should be. So at ISB, we developed a whole series of technologies and I'm not gonna go through and talk about these because 
except for one of them, because we don't have the time. But I'll make two points. One, I think third generation sequencing, uh, microfluidics, electronic detection, nanopores, nanochannels is utterly going to be revolutionary. And my prediction is there are two or three companies out there that look very promising in this regard. If they can carry it through in the next five to eight years, I think you'll see a hundred dollar genome without any problem, and the data will be far superior to any of the data we generate now, because it'll be uh, long reads and de novo assembly, all the things that we love. The second point I would say is, what is utterly going to be transformational in deconvoluting biological complexity are single cell analyses, and we have enormously fascinating data, but it's too complex to try and give in a short uh, overview lecture, but I think single cell analyses are gonna transform every aspect of our understanding of both biology and, uh, and disease. The strategies that we've developed, we'll talk about four. So number one, we've developed strategies that let us very nicely look at the complete dynamics of a disease in a model system, mice in our case, from the very beginning to the very end in terms of the network biology, and they show us clearly what the pathway for the future has to be in, in human disease. And what I'll say is wellness is absolutely the key in the future to being able to study the earliest transitions in human disease and following them all the way through. And we'll, We'll go into that in some detail. The second thing that we have done is uh, really pioneered this idea of family genome sequencing to identify disease genes, and I'll show you some fascinating new results on bipolar disease in that regard. A third thing is we've really made blood a window that lets us distinguish health from disease, and we'll talk about two really interesting examples there. And then finally, there are these longitudinal studies of wellness that we'll go ahead and start discussing. So let's talk then about the dynamics of prion-induced uh, neurodegeneration in mice. And the reason the prion induction is so important is when you inject those prion particles into the mouse brain, that's t equals zero for the initiation of the disease. So we know that in 22 weeks, the disease will follow its course through. So we examined the transcriptomes of normal and diseased mice at 10 different time points across this period, and we looked at the dynamics of disease. And we made two absolutely uh, fascinating kinds of uh, observations. One was, well, the first was really a horrifying observation. When we looked at the transcriptomes across that time period, uh, almost a third of the mouse genes changed. So here was a beautiful example of lots of biological noise. So what we did was to construct six inbred strain, prion strains of mice that were designed to subtract away major biologies, and we ended up with 300 genes that were almost certainly relevant to neurodegeneration. 200 of them mapped into four major networks that really form the heart of the neurodegenerative response. But what was really critical is those four networks became disease-perturbed in a sequential manner, with the most unique network being changed first, uh, and then uh, the three following downstream afterwards. And the reason that's important is in human disease, we want to see the first transitions. We want to understand the mechanisms. We want to ensure the diagnostics and therapeutics that can do the early reversion back to normalcy and not let them get into the degenerate, irreversible events that occur downstream. The other point I can make is that the other 100 genes that didn't map into these four major networks mapped into six smaller ones, and when you put all 10 of these networks together, they explain every aspect of the pathophysiology of the disease. It was really a beautiful confirmation of how powerful 
uh, disease perturbed network biology isn't explaining disease. But what was really critical is if we're to apply this to human disease, you can't go snipping into a human's brain and getting some brain so you can make a transcriptome analysis. Rather, we wondered whether we could use the blood to see the same kind of events that we saw in the brain transcriptome. And the approach that we took to doing that was identifying a series of brain-specific blood proteins that we could measure with mass spectrometry. And we were able to do that for, in the human, about 200, and for the mouse, in about 120 of these proteins. And these are all proteins that we could assay readily with classic targeted mass spectrometry techniques. And the importance was the following. All of these 200 human proteins mapped into fundamental biological processes in the brain. And at a steady state, the level of those proteins was unchanged. If one or more of those brain networks became disease perturbed, the level of their cognate proteins changed in a way that was characteristic for each different disease. Hence, you could distinguish wellness from disease, and if disease, which disease it was. And I'll just say in passing, uh, ISB through Rudy Abersall and Rob Moritz have really pioneered targeted proteomics, and this made it really easy to analyze at a very high level of specificity uh, up to 150 proteins in an hour or so. And Rob Moritz, more than that, has gone on to create assays for virtually all human proteins. So once you use systems biology to figure out which proteins you want to diagnose, we have ready assays to be able to do them very, very quickly. And to make a long story short, we found 15 mouse brain-specific proteins that mapped pretty evenly into the four major networks. And we were able to follow them with mass spectrometry in the blood and show with almost the same timing the one initial event of uh, the disease perturbation of, of replication and accumulation. And then two, the progressive transformation of other things as you move downstream. So it showed that we really could turn blood into a window for health and disease, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let me talk about family genome sequencing and the power we can use it to identify disease genes. We sequenced a, a Utah family back in 2009, as, as Willie had mentioned, and this was a family where the kids each had two different genetic diseases the parents were normal. And what we were able to demonstrate that was really striking is one, by using Mendelian genetics, we could correct many of the DNA sequencing errors. And we have now error rates with this kind of Mendelian genetics that are far, far less than one in a million. Number two, we were actually able to identify rare variants just by the fact that generally two or more members of the family had them. If they did, they couldn't be sequencing errors. And number three, and this was really important for identifying disease genes, with four members in a family, you can completely specify the haplotypes of each of those four members. That is, you can specify in the children the combinations of chromosomes and their recombinational events in the children. So the power of that is then you can ask, you can segregate the members of the family that have the disease and say, which haplotypes do they share? And immediately, you reduce dimensionality of the problem by 3 quarters. Uh, and in some cases, we've reduced it in multi-membered families to where it's about 0.1%. So you really can hone in on where these things are. So we've used this strategy to do lots of biology, to do lots of disease. We've studied aging, for example, in interesting ways. 
but we've also used it to do analyze structural variations in the genome and to develop software programs that let us um, uh, analyze various aspects of, of uh, disease gene identification in the context of, of, uh, of the power that Mendelian genetics give us uh, to discriminate signal-to-noise kinds of issues. And I won't go in and describe any of these, but let me tell you about our most recent studies in uh, bipolar disease, and this came out in the PNAS paper just a few months ago. And the, the study was, was really a fascinating one. We took 41 families that had multiple affected with regard to bipolar disease, and we sequenced about 200 of these members, both normal and the affected within the families. And then we compared them against uh, 150 or so uh, normal families' genomes that we sequenced. And, and the results were really striking. We were able to identify in the diseased individuals about 50 disease genes that had significant variants that would have affected their behavior or their expression. And all of those fell in the category of neuroexcitatory genes. And in fact, the dominant placement was uh, calcium ion transport channels and GABA receptor kinds of molecules. What we did then was to look at 3,000 sporadic individuals, and we took 25 of these genes, and we sequenced it in all 3,000, and we confirmed the top 15 or so of these genes as being present in the sporadics. So the really interesting, so every individual that had bipolar disease had two, if not three, or four of these defective genes, so it ends up really raising interesting questions about what complex genetic diseases are all about. And frankly, I suspect this is going to be a very similar picture in schizophrenia and autism and other neuropsychiatric kinds of uh, diseases. But the other take-home lesson that uh, I'll leave you with is that in one of these genes, we were able through, again, family genetics to identify 13 variants for a particular gene. 12 of the 13 fell outside the coding region. All of them fell in the promoter region, the five prime region, or the three prime end, the absolutely critical control regions. And for two of them, we've gone on to use molecular biology to show the variants change the expression patterns of the corresponding gene. So for all of you who are in love with exon sequencing, let me suggest in complex genetic diseases, you may want to really rethink how far you're going to go. And of course, with the genome-wide association data that we'll talk about later, the same is true. More than 90% of those variants lie outside of coding regions. So what this says is what we should have known for a long time. A lot of genetic disease is regulatory in nature, and we better get used to the fact and design our experiments to be able to uh, deal with that. So what about then um, uh, making blood a window into health and disease? And here I'll just mention an IOM report that came out in uh, 2012, which looked at about four or 500 studies earlier where people had these great cell science nature papers on new diagnostic biomarkers, and they made the comment that only one of them ever got into the clinic. And so they raised the question as why all the failures. Well, the failures came for two reasons. Number one, everyone essentially did studies where you compared change the, the blood of uh, normal individuals against the diseased individuals, and you saw enormous numbers of changes, and 99% of them are noise. So the question is, how do you get rid of the noise? And most people haven't the faintest idea how to get rid of the noise. And of course, the second was, they showed time and time again, when you did your diagnostic studies on a single population, when you took it to the general population, you were lucky if you had 50% of your results 
right. That is, you needed to build into your diagnostic multiple different population studies to cancel out the genetic polymorphisms and everything. And that's, those are exactly the stories we took seriously when, uh, together with a company I started about six years ago, Integrated Diagnostics, we set out to make, uh, to create a panel of proteins in the blood that could distinguish benign from neoplastic nodules. And the reason that's important is there are 3 million nodules a year pulmonary oncologists see in the US. So what do you do when you see one of these things? Well, what happens is on average, 600,000 went to various surgical procedures, and it turned out more than half of those surgical procedures were done on benign nodules. So increased morbidity, waste money. So the idea is could we separate out and, and distinguish those things? So we then uh, decided to use a systems approach to deal with uh, all this noise we talked about. So we took three different approaches to identifying initially about 400 candidate proteins that we had reason to believe were present in the blood. So lung cancer cells that secreted the proteins, lung cancer cells that had them as membrane proteins because many times membrane proteins are cleaved and secreted in the blood. And then uh, that, that was about 200 on the one hand, and then the last 200 came from the literature, any blood protein that looked like it might be related to uh, lung cancer. And what we found is only about half of those, 190 of those proteins were absolutely routinely detected. So what we did was to get the blood from 72 normal individuals uh, uh, with benign nodules and 72 uh, cancer individuals with malignant nodules and then ask for the 190 proteins, how they scored in making the 144 calls. And what we saw is that about uh, uh, 36 or so of these proteins were, re 32 of the proteins really scored much best than the remainder of them. So what we did then, and I think this was really an important point, is we took those 32 proteins and we asked the computer to make a million random panels of 10. We scored the panels with regard to their ability to make the calls. And then we asked, what were the most cooperative proteins in the sense, those proteins that were most frequently found in the highest scoring panels? And we ended up with 13 proteins that qualified. And we actually, let me just point out that we, we did these from four different populations originally, and when we did the validation, we did uh, completely new tests, plus brought in a new site, and the validation studies there were even better. So we then uh, took this to create a CLIA lab and started selling it to sellers, and it turned out to be a really easy thing to do because with uh, by reducing the a complex dimensionality from roughly 400 to 13, we were able to identify at that time about 40% of the benign nodules with 90% specificity, and now we can do uh, close to 60% that way. But we've also got a positive panel now where we can identify the neoplastic nodules as well. So you put the two together and you can really nail them very, very nicely. And what was true in this case here is you save the healthcare system $3.5 billion a year by avoiding 40% of those unnecessary surgeries, and the numbers have only gone up since that time. And of course, it improved the quality of healthcare for those patients that didn't have to go through those gruesome experiences. But, you know, a really interesting question is. We've done all these filtering to get 13 out of 400 proteins. What do those 13 proteins do? And it turns out that 12 of the 13 proteins map into three major disease perturbed networks in small cell lung cancer. So they collectively give us the ability to do very early diagnosis and follow the progression of these things just as I defined for the prion story. 
And, and, and one final story that's really interesting from a technical point of view. We're very interested in post-traumatic stress disorder and have looked at soldiers from Afghanistan that come back normal or come back with PTSD. And about three years ago, we identified a panel of eight biomarkers that had the ability at about 95% sensitivity and specificity to make the call. So this is discovery. We haven't done the validation yet. But the important point was some of the biomarkers were proteins and some of them were microRNAs. And the really important point about that is proteins and microRNAs are absolutely independent. So they get you out of a lot of statistical complications about overfitting and all these kind of things. That's kind of technical. But the important point is the last machine we invented is a machine that lets us measure uh, proteins and nucleic acids from the blood very, very well. So this is called the uh, N, N counter, nanostring N counter. It's a machine that can do single molecule detection. And, uh, I won't explain uh, how it does it, but the important point is from five lambda of blood, we can actually make beautiful ELISA assay protein measurements with the instrument. At the same time, we make microRNA or RNA messenger measurements at the same time. And actually, recently, and this opens up some really exciting new possibilities, we've been able to demonstrate that you can also do SNPs beautifully with this. So you can look at four different kinds of measurements from one sample and one instrument, and I'd say this is something we want to think about in the future. Peptide protein capture agents are going to replace uh, antibodies. This is utterly pioneered by Jim Heath at Caltech, a colleague. We've worked on this for a long time, and a couple of years ago we created a company called Indy Molecular, it's about the creating these kind of reagents. And the essence of the idea is the following. Jim has made libraries of 10 to the 6 circular D amino acid peptides, and he's taken those libraries to a protein you'd like to make a capture agent to, and what you can find is you have monomers that bind with low affinity. What you can do is you can take two of those monomers binding with low affinity and you can link them in the appropriate three-dimensional configuration to make a dimer, or if you do three, you can make a trimer. And dimers in these circular peptides give mid-nanomole sensitivity, typically what reasonable antibodies are. And if you make trimers, you can get picomole level sensitivity. So these things uh, are really sensitive. What is also exciting is Jim has recently demonstrated that if you use strategies for picking out the appropriate peptide epitopes of a protein, you can focus the protein capture agents on that peptide. And the key point is if you do that, you reduce enormously the cross-reactivities that plague antibodies when you use them to assay complex mixtures. A really, really important point. And more recently, what Jim has been able to demonstrate is these reagents are going to be incredible therapeutic reagents. So he was very quickly to, able to make a reagent that blocked beautifully KRAS with a 10 to 1 specificity against the wild type, and on and on and on. So I would say, one, these things are rock stable, so you can put them in an envelope and send them to Africa. The affinity changes not at all. And you can do the assays any place. doesn't matter if it's uh, 100 degrees out or so. Number two, it's sensitive, as I said. You get a log increase in sensitivity with each monomer. And, and it's digital, which is really cool. That is, if we know the two circular peptides and the structure of the linking, uh, click chemistry linking reagent, we can put all three of those in vitro with copper catalysis and make large quantities. So these are independent of animals, okay? Four, um, uh, the lack of cross-reactivity, I think is really gonna be important. 
And, and frankly, the lack of cross-reactivity for therapeutic reagents could really be utterly critical. And you know, as you think about cancer therapies and so forth, as long as your drugs are small molecules, you're doomed to enormous cross-reactivity. There is no way you can avoid it. These small molecules, which are 4,000, 5,000 Daltons, we, we can actually target very, very specifically what we're looking at. Um, we think we can scale up the production of these things. So you can do in vitro, uh, in vivo diagnosis, and we've demonstrated beautifully both those, and again, that they're gonna be therapeutic reagents. And we've probably made therapeutic reagents for uh, four or five different examples now, so it's a, it's a pretty routine kind of thing. I think it's gonna replace monoclonal antibodies in the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm gonna show you at the very end of the lecture how I wanna use these to create a wellness assay that is utterly gonna be transformational. But you'll have to wait for that. So anyway, um, the convergence of four major scientific uh, 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 and, and social thrusts have led to P4 medicine as we know it today. So systems biology or systems medicine, uh, this digital revolution of self-measurements, the Apple Watch, the Fitbit, uh, all of those kind of things. Um, big data in its analytics and social networks. And I'll tell you why I think uh, each of those are really important. So let me tell you that P4 medicine, so it's predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. And, and look, the first three Ps are pretty straightforward. It's the essence of the ideal medicine we'd all like. But what the essence of the participatory is about is the patient should be at the center of making decisions about their own health. And we think they really can, given the proper amount of uh, information. So P4 differs from its counterpart in that it's proactive, not reactive. It's all about focusing on individuals and not populations. It's all about focusing on wellness as well as disease, but really putting a primary focus on wellness. It's about creating these dense and dynamic data clouds that we talked about. And it shows enormously skeptic, uh, skepticism about the way we approach clinical trials now where we'll take 30,000 patients and we'll give them a cancer drug or placebo record from the population. You know, every one of those patients is unique genetically and environmentally. And when you average populations like that, you do a beautiful job of increasing the noise and decreasing the signal and big pharma has demonstrated this over and over again. So what we would do is 30,000 individual patients, each with their dense dynamic data cloud, and we'd stratify them according to the properties we're interested in based on what they are. So will they react to a cancer drug or not react to it or these kinds of things. And of course, uh, this also raises the possibility of doing fascinating NF1 experiments, and we'll talk a little bit more about that at a later point in time. And of course, the, the social networks are really key, both for teaching the patient population about the new medicine, for letting them think about crowdsourcing as a means of improving their own health, and of course, I think patients in social networks are going to be the key advocates to begin changing a healthcare system that is intrinsically incredibly conservative and reluctant to change. Whether it's at the level of regulation, at the level of payers, insurance, or at the level of providers, you run into this. I have great stories I can tell you. But, uh, so P4 medicine then is about these two things, scientific wellness on the one hand, and about dealing with disease on the other hand. And the unfortunate truth is 98% of society's resources go into disease today, very little into wellness, and it has a, a, a appropriately skeptical view of it because it hasn't been quantified, and we can quantify it. I'll, I'll tell you how we're gonna quantify it a little bit later on. 
what is really important to realize is that I think starting from today, there's going to be a whole new thrust in healthcare, which is called scientific wellness. And I think increasingly, resources are going to go from society, from disease, over into the wellness, to the point where I'd argue that the wellness, as opposed to the disease industry in 10 to 15 years, will have far and away the largest market cap. The effort is really going to be focused uh, on wellness in the future. And let me just say, there are two essential facts about wellness. If you come away with nothing from this lecture, remember these. So one is the idea that wellness allows us to optimize human potential by optimizing our wellness, our ability to perform uh, both mentally and physically. But two, wellness is the key to understanding disease because we have to be able to follow wellness and transitions into disease to get those very earliest points that we, whose disease perturbed networks we can capture and then reverse immediately back, saving society all the downstream kind of money. This is a horrifying fact. If we look at how the average length of life has been increasing, you can make a calculation. Half the children born in this uh, calendar year will live to be 100. And the really key question is, what is the quality of their life for the last 30 years? And we've got a long ways to go if we're going to ensure a reasonable quality. And that, again, is why I think wellness is important. So as I said earlier, we started at the beginning of 2014 a pilot project called the Pioneer 100, where we actually got 107 individuals to agree to come into a study where we did complete genome sequence analyses. We got uh, blood, urine, and saliva every three months to get clinical chemistries, 1,700 metabolites, 400 proteins. And then every three months, we also captured the gut microbiome. And then we used the Fitbit and other uh, self-quantifying measurements to put together then uh, these dense and dynamic data clouds. And of course, the purpose of the dense and dynamic data clouds was to let us then go into a literature that we'd surveyed to create a database of actionable possibilities. And these were actionable possibilities that arose from each of the five major data types that I talked about there. And the idea is these actionable possibilities, if acted upon by the individuals, will improve wellness or let you uh, avoid disease. And what we found in the course of this study is as we started integrating different types of data together, all sorts of new actionable possibilities emerge. So it's going to go on increasing in the future. And scientific wellness should be a lifetime journey and not a journey for a month or a year or something like that. And we'll talk more about that in, in a few moments. The really key point of these studies is we used a coach to bring the actionable possibilities to each of the 107 individuals, both in the context of explaining what the actionable possibility meant, but even more in terms of putting that actionable possibility in the context of each individual's own healthcare objectives. And they were great psychologists at persuading people to change their behavior to adopt the actionable possibilities. 70% of the actionable possibilities were acted upon. At the beginning of the study, if we could have gotten 5%, I think I would have been pretty happy. But this coach was uh, absolutely spectacular. And this raises utterly fascinating NF1 experiments for nutrition, inflammation, pre-diabetes, a whole variety of different kinds of things. So Nathan Price, my colleague uh, at the Institute, and I have uh, pioneered this whole study and its effort. And I think among the most spectacular things that we've discovered is the idea that we can begin making data correlations that are staggering in their dimensionality. And it's very much like the Hubble telescope when it first 
cast its eye out into the heavens, it was able to look at the dark matter of the universe. I think the data we're gathering here is letting us look at the dark matter of human biology and human disease in ways we've never been able to do so before. And to give you just a diachromatic example, we divided the five major data types there, and this is only a partial demonstration of this. And we asked for each individual data type within a particular type, did it have any statistical correlations with any bits of data in any of the other four data types? And let me just say, we could ask that in two dimensions. We could ask that at one point in time for all the 107 individuals, or we could look at how all of those things changed over time. So, and you get very different answers. So we'll, we'll come to that in, in just a moment. But just to give you an example of these correlations, one of the correlations that was absolutely fascinating is there's a gut microbe that had a striking negative correlation with bile acid. So we did a text search of the literature and found indeed this microorganism eats bile acid. So there is a disease of the third trimester of pregnancy called coleostasis where the female's hormones block the uh, bile duct and it spills bile acid into the blood and you, the woman loses her appetite. She flushes in response to this very acidic environment and it's a miserable third term of pregnancy. Suppose we could make a probiotic out of that microbe that the woman could drink and readdress that bile acid mismatch immediately. So that's, that's one kind of correlation. These correlations have shown us systems that were linked together. We had no idea were. They've shown us new kinds of actionable possibilities. They've, they've raised interesting kind of disease mechanisms. And, here we've done a little further text search, and there are 10 interesting correlations that come out of the 35,000 correlations that we've already described. Now, you can argue whether 107 people and what the power of the statistics are. We can say that we did three different statistical packages, and all of these 35,000 survived all three of those uh, analyses. But uh, we're soon going to have many, many more correlations than this. So the, the data, on the one hand, if you look at an analysis at one point in time, you can begin to, to get correlations that lead to interesting uh, insights on wellness and disease mechanisms. And if you do the temporal analysis, you can actually begin to stratify patients in ways we could never stratify them before. And for most complex diseases, those stratifications are key to disambiguating their complexity and everything. So we think these are going to be very powerful techniques. And, and the final point, uh, which is utterly fascinating, is the fact that the average number of double knockouts in this human population was four for each individual. We have all of these chemistries, so we can begin fascinating. And let me just say, look, the four weren't fundamental genes. And in fact, none of these genes, do we have any idea what they do? But by looking at the chemistries, we can begin to delineate what, at least what categories these genes have to fall into. And I'll just throw out one terrifying statistic for NIST to think about. When we did complete genomic analyses, we got an average of four double knockouts per individual, okay? When we did Illumina analyses, we got 30. And I'll tell you, I don't believe the 30 for a minute, and it talks about fundamental intrinsic limitations and how the sequencing's done, but uh, we don't need to get into that. So uh, a second point that was utterly staggering is we can actually determine your genetic risk now for 60 or 70 diseases. And that is because we've become convinced that GWAS data can be used to determine genetic risk. And the GWAS data we've looked is those that looked at very large populations and got 
uh, many loci, 72 here in this case, that, uh, that controlled lipid kind of thing. And the important thing is these markers all have very small effects on the phenotype, and they can be positive or negative, red or green. But what you can do for each individual is you can add up the variants they have, and that will begin to give you some idea of a genetic risk. And what we've demonstrated is if you take those genetic risks and you bin the 107 individuals from very low risk to very high risk and three other categories in between, you can show there's a beautiful correlation between the genetic risk and the disease phenotype shown in green here, uh, which is uh, cholesterol, LDL cholesterol level. And this dips off right here because those are the people that take statins. So if you subtract them out, then you have a beautiful linear correlation. So I'll tell you, we've done this for four other diseases. We get the same answers for all four. And you'll see one more uh, in just, just a moment or two. But um, one of the really interesting things is people out here that are predisposed to the disease may not actually have the disease yet, OK? Yet there are markers that are associated with genetic risk that are not associated with the disease state. And that's part of the signal to noise that the diagnostic companies have to deal with. And this is the ideal way to disambiguate that enormous source of uh, noise. Um, we have more than 2,000 relatively normal genomes from a similar kind of population, so we've put uh, these genetic scores into those. And again, for the lipid thing, for 2,000 people, we more or less get a bell-shaped curve that looks like that. But we can get a relative understanding of the genetic risk of the 107 by just mapping them onto a orthologous uh, type of population. And uh, there are, as I say, about 70, 60 or 70 diseases and or uh, disease phenotypes for which we can do these genetic risks. And one that we're really interested in is Alzheimer's disease. And again, here's looking at the 2,000 individuals with regard to GWAS markers that are late onset. And there's this fantastically interesting shoulder on this uh, distribution. But anyway, we can take the upper level at high risk for this disease and what we're in the process of doing is assessing both from the GWAS markers and the APOE4 alleles about 200 individuals that have very, very high genetic risk for Alzheimer's. And the idea then is to subject these two to the dense dynamic data cloud analyses where we're actually really hyping up immune response measurements brain measurements and liver measurements. We think those are the really the. So, because what we'd like to be able to do is capture these individuals at the very earliest point of transition from wellness to Alzheimer's. And the reason for doing that is we have a collaborator at UCLA that has a 36 interventional uh, perturbation program that he's convinced if you give him early transition people, he can delay their onset of disease for five to 15 years, and he's had absolutely spectacular results. So who wouldn't want to be in this, uh, this kind of study? The gut microbiome, here's the distribution of gut microbes all the way across here, and you can see it's a very broad spectrum of different microbes that are at least compatible with a sense of wellness. But uh, anyway, what I think is really interesting is we've been the 107 individuals with regard to Crohn's disease uh, from very low to very high, and then superimposed on top of that the averaged gut microbiome scores. And what you can see beautifully is there is an inflammatory microbe that is absolutely proportional to the level of the genetic risk. Again, really, it's another confirmation that you can do these genetic risk uh, calculations. Uh, and we have in this population only one individual that's been actually diagnosed. He falls in the 
high risk category. And he has interesting markers that none of the rest do. And again, it reinforces the markers for disease are different from the markers for genetic disease correlation. So um, state transitions, uh, we've seen less to more wellness and the inverse. We've seen wellness to disease and the inverse. And of course, we've seen a lot of changes when people acted upon uh, their actionable possibilities. In the first clinical chemistry we ever did, 90% of the people had uh, severe nutrient abnormalities, uh, 68 inflammatory, uh, 59 cardiovascular, and 54 diabetic. Uh, we had 23 pre-diabetics. We moved all of them over into better space. Seven moved completely to normal space. We found two of the 107 were frank diabetes well along in their disease. Their physician should be fired. But uh, anyway, uh, um, there are a lot of uh, things you can tell from the genetic variants. You can determine effective diets. You can determine effective exercise. You can see who's really susceptible to uh, metal toxins. For example, we had two people that had blazingly high levels of mercury. And it turned out both of them were fanatic tuna sushi eaters. When they gave up tuna, their levels dropped immediately and they came back to normal. So if you love sushi, stay away from tuna. If you have the gene that makes it difficult to handle it. And, and there are a whole series of variants that have to do with athletic injuries and so forth. We had uh, a whole series. 5% of the individuals had chronic diseases. And, and what this says is really remarkable. That is, we're enormously adaptive organisms, and we can be sick and adapt to really pretty incredible conditions. I would say if we had a 0 to 100 scale for wellness, we had only a few that were in that very top level. And I would say the majority were around or below the 50% level with lots of serious actionable possibilities. But one of them that was very interesting was an individual who came in with chronic arthritis that had been going increasingly worse over the last year. And when we looked at his transferrin levels, they were blazingly high, meaning he had very high levels of iron. And when we looked at his genome, he was homozygous for the gene for hemochromatosis. Now, people that are homozygous for this disease only in 30% of the time get the disease. So here was one of the first symptoms of hemochromatosis is chronic arthritis. So what we did was gave that information to his physician. Uh, he had two bleeds, and then at the end of the 10-month period, he was at normal and he'd lost completely his arthritis. And you can do a calculation about how much you'd save society if you had let him go on to, you know, to have frank disease, which is always irreversible with regard to your heart, your liver, your pancreas, and, and finally your arthritis and so forth. So um, we can do these marvelous statistical correlations and what they mean for the most part, uh, we have to figure out uh, the correlation of genetic risk with GWAS scores and with disease phenotypes is really compelling. And I didn't talk about this, but we've looked, we've analyzed individuals that went from less to greater wellness, and we found great metabolites and proteins that could be the beginning of a wellness panel that I think in time will let us not only quantify psychological wellness, but physiologic wellness and divide them. So anyway, we'll see how all of that goes. The, the pioneer insights were interesting. For many, this was the experience of a lifetime. Uh, the fact that they could control their own health with the proper amount of data was really exciting. I think this is one of the keys to reducing the cost of health care. Uh, the fact that your genome doesn't control your destiny, just your potential. And with many genome things, proper uh, kinds of modifications can get you around limitations, especially with regard to 
nutrition, inflammation, uh, and even things like uh, a tendency to prediabetes and things like that. Uh, every one of the 107 had multiple actionable possibilities, most really a lot. We never ever gave in one session, and the sessions were once a month, any more than three actionable possibilities. So they didn't get overwhelmed. 70% um, were acted upon, and of course, all the pioneers virtually wanted to go on to the next study. And the next study was our creating about three months ago a company called Aravel, scientific wellness company focused on consumers. And I'm not going to talk much about it except to say it's the easiest company I've ever raised money for because one, it's an idea whose time has come, and two, we were able to move all of the people who did the 107 pioneers right into the company and we were ready to go. Uh, we're going to, in the next 18 months, get uh, 10,000 dense dynamic data clouds, and that's going to let us do all sorts of exciting things. And I think, I think this consumer-based medicine is really going to push wellness in a way we can't do as an academic. So that's the reason we decided to put a major focus there. On the other hand, ISB is reaching out to seek academic collaborations with people that want to use this wellness approach in one of two ways. One is we've done to promote wellness, but the other is it can really transform our understanding of disease. For example, one of the things we've already set up is we're going to be bringing wellness to about 200 women who've gone through the gruesome uh, rigors of, uh, of uh, breast cancer and uh, therapy and everything. And I think we can transform the quality of their life in a relatively short period of time. So there are lots of things that one could uh, think about doing this. And we're really interested in developing new diagnostic assays. And we're interested in much more comprehensively covering all the things that you, you might think about. But I think among the most important assays we're going to develop in the future are complex assays that integrate multiple complex systems. So for example, heart rate variability integrates parasympathetic. Sympathetic, it is an incredible dynamic measure of that system. The one I'm most excited about is I want to use people's faces and correlate that from wellness to greater wellness or wellness to disease transitions because we have incredible facial recognition software now. In fact, I saw a horrifying slide where a fellow took a salesman from a company, took your picture from Facebook, and he put 10% of your face into the salesperson's face. Now, you can't recognize the difference, but psychologically, you're much more sympathetic to that person. So that's the power of what this thing can do. Uh, and uh, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be attacked that way, but I'm not on Facebook, so maybe I won't have to worry. But uh, anyway. Uh, I think digitizing this, making it less expensive, the assays are by far the most expensive part of the assay. So what have we done? We've created all sorts of new actionable possibilities. We've used them to optimize wellness for individuals. We're beginning to get metrics for wellness that will allow us to quantify it. We can look at transitions, wellness to disease, and we'd like for every major disease to be able to nail them early and reverse them as quickly as possible. We want to develop old assays in better formats and develop new assays and lead to a digitalization of medicine. The databases, I think, are going to be transformational for creating new companies in this wellness industry sphere and so forth. And I think this is the essence of P4 medicine improving the quality of health care, reducing the cost, and, and promoting innovation, and so forth. And this is the last technical thing I'll talk about. So what I'd like to do in the next five years or so, and we've done this for 25 human organs already, 
I'd like to gain, identify 50 organ-specific blood proteins for each of your 50 major organ systems. I'd like to use these peptide protein capture agents to create a stable ELISA assay system. And Jim Heath has already demonstrated that he can put together in a single little chip using a droplet of blood, 50 ELISA assays that work beautifully with good sensitivity, and actually he's got this to work in the hospital. So suppose that we could take a drop of blood from you every month and do this analysis. We'd be able for all your major organ systems to see any transitions from wellness to disease and act immediately upon them. I think that's the ultimate in, uh, in uh, a wellness assay. Okay, and this is my very last slide. What do I see in the healthcare vision? I see one, P4 medicine being a central part of the healthcare system in the future. Uh, number two, your health is a function of both your genetics and your environment, and these dense dynamic data clouds are absolutely exquisite measurements of those two things and their integration and so forth. Uh, wellness is key, not only to optimize your, uh, your, your, your health via optimizing your wellness, but it's key in following very, very early disease transitions as well. With 10,000 deep dynamic data clouds, we're going to have completely new approaches to the stratification of patients to the delineation of mechanisms we never thought we could get at easily. It is going to fundamentally change how pharma, how biotech, how <coughs> nutrition companies, how, how diagnostic companies operate and everything. And I think the consumer-based program that we see, actually we're talking with two countries about the possibility of enrolling their entire relatively small populations in this. Uh, I think this is going to push a democratization of healthcare that in the not too distant future will let us think about how to bring it to the poor as well as the rich. Democratization, really inconceivable uh, even five years ago. And, and then the final point is, and this is the point I really love, I think this approach can deal both with aging and with the end-of-life transition to death that often costs people 50% of their resources and everything. So how do we go about doing that? Eric Topol at Scripps has studied uh, 1,000 individuals that are 90 years or older that have never been to a hospital, never been sick, never taken a drug a day in their life, and are in incredibly good shape. And he calls them the welderly. So, Remember that for one sec. And the, the second observation I made about three years ago in the course of studying the complete genome sequences of 18 individuals, 150, uh, 115 or older, uh, and the hope was with the complete genome sequence, we could identify the genes that uh, generated longevity. And it turned out it was naive in the extreme because the exam we didn't have enough examples to drive the, the whole business. But what I did learn is if you live to be 100 or so, you almost always die really rapidly of a complete systems crash. So my vision for all of you, were you to join something like Airfail, is look, join us, have a lifetime where you respond to these actionable possibilities, and I'll give you with some reasonable insurance that this could push you up into the category of the welderly. So let's get you into the 90s, physically and mentally functional and capable. And then if we finally get you to 100, you're on your own for the complete systems crash. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. And I think there's time for a few questions, but I won't. Let's say something first. Uh, I guess I last heard you talk about three, four years ago, after, right after our mutual friend passed. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you talk on P4 medicine, and boy, you've taken it to a completely different level. Very, very impressed. Questions? Yeah, this definitely is a, a lot of 
The question I have is, uh, how do you compare and contrast with uh, what's been termed as functional medicine? With functional medicine? Functional medicine. Uh, practice. So I think functional medicine has a lot of the elements of what we're talking about, but they really don't know how to execute in the same kind of way that we talked about here. So we've given talks at a couple of functional medicine conferences and gotten standing ovations. So they're 100% on board with this. And for the first time, they see how to uh, take it to the next level. And, and you know, a great example is all these people that have, for example, Fitbits. I mean, you know, after you've gotten your 10,000 steps for uh, six months, you can ask yourself, gee, where does this go? What, what, I mean, you know, is, is this what I do the rest of my life? And that's all. And, and I think what we have to do is realize that wellness is this fantastic multidimensional thing. And to really optimize it, we need to bring in data of all sorts and all types. And activity data is great, but you need clinical chemistry. You need the genome sequence as a framework for really thinking about how you integrate all the other kinds of information and everything. The, the genome itself has by far, uh, of all the single data types, by far the most actionable possibilities. And of course, you, you run into challenges with the FDA who says uh, people that are uh, direct to consumer kind of people can't be practicing medicine. But when you push them on what is the difference between wellness and medicine, man, they haven't the faintest idea. So it's. Uh, it's, it's uh, a really interesting time out there. I think things are, are, are changing. One of the things I'm really excited about is I'm negotiating with a big uh, healthcare system in Seattle. And if I can persuade them to take us on, I think we could really insert these things very, very quickly. So it wouldn't be 10 or 15 years. I'd love to see it be five years or less. I don't have that much time. I can't wait 15 years. So anyway, but uh, yes. Um, since you talked about the Hubble, one of the great advances, uh, I think one of the great advantages taken from the Hubble data was the fact that it was shared and it was open through the virtual observatory and that allowed great, great, great advances in the science. So can you speak to that idea of how do you want to share this data and, and um, do you think you want to open the data to the world? And, and what should we be thinking if we start to do other cohorts and measurements? So what I would say unequivocally is for the academic data that ISB will generate, and I think we will generate a lot that, that we plan to collaborate and make available to the community. I think the data generated by the company is, is quite a different category in the sense that I think they have to be given an opportunity uh, to realize their investment before they dump it out into the world for everybody to take advantage of. But having said that, I'm really insistent that we ought to set a timeline where all of these kinds of uh, data really become available. Because I'm, I'm a firm believer in open data. And look, that's what's transformed the genome. I mean, at the very beginning, we had these meetings that said, when you finish any piece, 2,000 or longer, you shall put it in the database, whatever you think about it. And that, that was a transformational kind of decision. So I think where possible, data should be made available. But on the commercial side, it is more complicated just to be uh, to fair. And, and I will say, look, I would have stood no chance in the world of getting the resources to do 10,000 dense dynamic data clouds from NIH or anybody in the federal government. We can do it commercially, and I think it's worth it to, uh, to push that kind of idea and get these things out as much as we can. So. So that Eric have a question then. So a couple of comments. I was trained as a traditional physician during the entire time that I practiced, because I retired early, I practiced traditional medicine. And my wife has been a critical care nurse, and she's well into wellness. And the things that have frustrated me uh, through the years and observing are several. One is that 
for 50 years, we developed great techniques, great diagnostic techniques, surgical techniques, and drugs. They're very expensive to implement and provide, and sometimes they have very little change in longevity or quality of life. So the medical pharmacological industry is making a lot of money, and it's costing our federal government a lot of money, but it's not making a great impact. The second is that a lot of people, you know, 60% of hospital admissions and hospital care dollars now are based on um, personal lifestyle choices, not on disease. And so I'm, I'm excited about what this movement has produced because as the cost of analyzing the genome is going down, the opportunity to apply that technology is going up. What if, if you wanted to do a panel, which was metabolic, um, chemistries, blood chemistries, genomic, and then social, you know, a social economic survey. In a clinic in five years, if someone's running in, you say, we're going to start by doing this panel, like right now the MRIs do a top to bottom MRI. What do you mm -hmm. think the cost of that panel would be to initiate a therapeutic course in a wellness center? Well, I think you have a lot of flexibility in, in the end. It depends how ambitious you are. But I think you could get started in a very powerful way for per individual for um, three or $4,000. I, I, I really think the whole genome has to be, and it's the most limiting. It's the most expensive by far. But if this new third generation sequencing comes in, if we have $100 genomes, then that changes the equation enormously. And, and you know, we've heard a lot of debate about clinical chemistries and a company in California that presumably can miniaturize and do these things more effectively. And, and I, I really believe that kind of technology is there. It's maybe they don't have it. I don't really know. But it's there. So I think the cost of the assays, which is the real cost of wellness now, is going to follow Moore's law. And I would say in five to eight years, it'll cost five to 10 percent, the, the assays will cost five to 10 percent of what they, what they are today if we drive the technologies to really change these kind of things. Now, we have to temper that slightly. I really want to do these complex phenotypic assays, and I'm not sure how much some of those are going to end up costing. I know they'll be enormously worthwhile, but if you my argument is, in two or three years, we'll have enough data that we can go to insurance companies and we can lay out the economic arguments as to why this approach is going to save them enormous numbers of dollars. And in fact, what I'm really pushing my health care provider, I'm saying, look, you should become a payer. You ought to get the benefits of all of these savings and you'll really be in the driver's seat. now." That may be too much to, uh, to push on them. But uh, I think if I were in insurance companies, I'd be worried about that happening in the future as people realize what's going to happen. So anyway, I, I hope I answered your question. And, and one last brief comment. In the latter part of your lecture, I was thinking about your last line, that wellness dealing with aging can be very cost effective to society. But the flip side of that is, and it's going to be a very difficult debate in society how to use this, at the end of life, when we're spending 90% or 80% of our health care dollars on the last five years of people's life, personalized and predictive medicine will actually be able to decide if a proposed therapy will carry much benefit. And if it doesn't, we'll have to make the societal choice that you don't provide that service sure. if when it's personalized and specific, the benefits are low. Yeah. I mean, what I'd really hope, as I said, is that these actual possibilities will ele elevate all of us to the welderly, and we'll get into that range where we don't have to worry about these expensive long declines, but it will we'll go quickly. But I suspect what will happen then is we'll be living in good shape out into the 110s or 20s. I mean, I think we can, I think you can push that out. Uh, considerably if, 
if people for their lifetime deal with themselves reasonably. So. And Mark, you don't, need, you don't need a microphone. So Lee, I, uh, thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll just stand up here. Lee, I'm thrilled and I'll echo uh, Willie's remarks about the um, trans transitions uh, over time in E4 medicine and the progress of the 100,000 uh, person mm -hmm. wellness project. And uh, I, I'm also thrilled to, to know that you're targeting um, partnership with the Precision Medicine Initiative. And, uh, of course, it's an obvious, uh, it's a, that's a win for, for the Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, so a, 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 there are, I have a portfolio of questions, but I'm going to focus on this one. Um, <laughs> it strikes me that, that con controlling in this experiment, mm -hmm. having a control for when your wellness is being derived from truly actionable information and when the wellness is being derived from the psychological effect of being in the wellness uh, experiment. Um, I mean, there's, there's the ethics of doing a controlled experiment here. Is it's really intriguing. complicated, yes. yeah. So I agree with you completely, and we've, look, Please we're writing well. a big paper for Cell on this now, and I can just see the reviewers saying, you know, where are your controls? And we decided our controls were gonna be are individuals. And if we look at them as N of one experiments, we can derive all sorts of insights that are really, so I think we can begin to get at those kinds of things, particularly as we develop the metrics for wellness. Because what that will let us do is it will give us a starting stage to know how well you are, and then we can see the incremental kind. Now, how you separate out placebo from all the other things, uh, we'll have to learn how to do that. I don't have a simple answer to that. I think that's a fascinating question. So. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to see so many of the students remaining here because the future that Lee is working to provide is you guys are truly going to be the beneficiary. It's too late for me to make, take the right decisions to not lose my hair, for example. But you guys, you are really the beneficiaries, and you really had the pleasure of hearing from one of the true pioneers of our generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.